and anyone and everyone, and by everyone, I mean everyone, who puts their faith and trust in Him, and Him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is, that you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes, life. This is the gospel. Dynamic, engaging, accurate. Everyone who puts their faith and trust in Him and Him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. True? The Apostle John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What we have here is a disconnect. The video says, just trust in him to be forgiven. But John says, confess your sins to be forgiven. We need more evidence, more information on how to get God's mercy and be forgiven. Is it a matter of just trusting or are we told to do more? These verses will help. He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. Confessing and forsaking sin? That sounds like repentance, changing our mind about continuing in sin, determined to live in a way that pleases God. So then, if we will come to God in repentance, we were promised his mercy and our past sins will be forgiven and erased? Is that what the Bible says? Exactly. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Outside of repentance we will perish, as Jesus warned. Except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. The Apostle Peter wrote that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We have sound evidence that just trusting in Him is not enough. We must come to repentance, confessing and forsaking sin, to be forgiven, and to avoid perishing. We need to get rid of this just trust in Him idea. Eternity is at stake here. We need to get this right. So, what is the Gospel? And how does being forgiven relate to the Gospel? The Gospel is two things. First, it is the good news that Jesus brought of the coming kingdom of God here on earth. Jesus went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. In God's kingdom, Jesus will judge among the nations. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Second, the gospel is the good news that we can be saved, saved from perishing. We can receive the gift of eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The word believe is often understood to mean to have trust that something is true. Therefore, many conclude we can avoid perishing, and have eternal life, by just having trust. But just minutes ago, we saw that unless we come to repentance, confessing and forsaking sin, we'll perish without mercy. Confusing? Yes. We need to sort this out. When it comes to the important things, like our salvation, we would be well advised to follow the directions given to us by our Savior. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So what are the directions? What are we told to do? Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist preached, Repentance for the remission of sins. Peter preached, Come to repentance, or else perish. Paul preached God, now commands all men everywhere to repent. If we'll obey, confessing and forsaking sin, we'll enter his promised mercy, as we saw earlier. We'll be forgiven. We'll have remission of sins that are past. We'll be purged of our old sins. As we saw earlier, our past sins will be blotted out. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. How do we enter the presence of the Lord? By receiving the Holy Spirit, which God gives to them that obey Him, to those who come to Him in repentance. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus will lead us into the truth and will help us overcome slavery to sin and will lead us into love for God and neighbor. He is the potter, we are the clay. Outside of abiding in him in repentance, he cannot work with us. Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. When our past sins are blotted out, we also have redemption. The death penalty we had earned for our past sins is covered. Jesus died to make his death, his blood, available to cover the death penalty we earned for sin. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Thank you, Jesus. Without the redemption Jesus made available by his sacrifice, we would all be hopelessly doomed to perish as the wages of our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But now, if we'll come to him in repentance, we'll no longer be hopelessly doomed. Jesus will be our mediator and advocate with the Father, and will present his sacrifice, his death and blood, to cover the death penalty we earn for sin. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. This is how we enter justification in right standing with God. But we are not yet saved. Note how Paul separates justification and salvation. They are different things at different times. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Salvation comes in the future through him. Salvation is only possible if we abide in Jesus and in repentance follow the Holy Spirit. As long as we are abiding in Him, present tense, and are following the Holy Spirit, present tense, we remain in justification, not under condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We are human and will sin even after coming to repentance. But as long as we abide in Jesus, and in repentance follow the Holy Spirit, He remains our advocate with the Father. He continues, present tense, to cover new sins with His blood. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Justification is alive and active. It is a present tense, living, working relationship with Jesus and the Father not a once-and-done event of the past. Paul wrote, being now justified, not having been justified. As long as we abide in Jesus and in repentance follow the Holy Spirit, we are in spiritual life. We are in His goodness or grace, and we have the hope of salvation, the promised gift of eternal life, to be received at Jesus' revelation, His return, His second coming. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be wrought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At Jesus' return, the dead in Christ will be resurrected from their graves. They, along with those in Christ which are alive and remain, will receive the gift of eternal life. Paul described this, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Upon receiving eternal life, we will have been saved, saved from ever perishing in death. We will have eternal security, and we will have a much more meaningful future than some sort of eternal vacation off in heaven. We will be teaching and ruling with Jesus in the kingdom of God, right here on earth. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. We have free will, and if we choose to no longer abide in Jesus, and to return to a life of unrepentance and willful sin, then there is no more sacrifice to cover our new sins. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, 
but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. No longer abiding in Jesus and no longer following the Holy Spirit, we would return to condemnation. No longer in justification and no longer in His goodness or grace, we'd be cut off and we'd forfeit that hope of salvation. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Perhaps you're wondering, what about faith? How does faith fit in? Saving grace is received through faith, not just because we have faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is through faith, through trust that God exists and rewards, that we see we have a choice to make, to either come to God or else to just remain in our old life, preferring the attractions and approval of the world. Without faith, we could not see that choice, so it would be impossible for us to decide to come to God. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Faith is necessary, but it is not enough. It is the decision to come to God on His terms, in repentance, that pleases Him, and for which we enter His promised mercy and for which we have our past sins blotted out, and for which we receive redemption from the death penalty we had earned for past sins, and for which we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, by which we enter the presence of the Lord. That is how we enter justification and grace, and have the hope of salvation, the promised gift of eternal life, which we can only receive through Him. Faith and believe are different words in the original Greek. Faith was a noun, something you have, trust, or intellectual acceptance. Believe was a verb, committing to and acting on your faith. The Apostle James used Abraham's example to illustrate the difference. True believers, like Abraham, are those who act on their faith and obey God. Abraham was deemed a believer not by faith only, but because he acted on his faith and obeyed. He left for the promised land and later offered Isaac. His action, his obedience, was his works. Here is James. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Believing goes beyond faith only. Acting on our faith, obeying, brings our faith to life. Otherwise, our faith is dead. Now when we read John 3.16, believe comes alive in its full meaning. Believers act on their faith and obey. They come to God on His terms. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We have seen that outside of repentance, confessing and forsaking sin, we receive no mercy and will perish, as Jesus warned. Therefore, believe in John 3.16 necessarily goes beyond faith alone. More is required than faith alone. We must act on our faith and come to God on his terms in repentance. Faith is the gift of God given to us to call us. Similar to Abraham, we also are called to journey, to take the narrow way to the promised land, eternal life in the kingdom of God. Question is, will we follow directions and answer the call and come to God?